Teach me to walk in the light of His love. Teach me to pray to my Father above. Teach me to know all the things that are right. Teach me, teach me to walk in the Hello everyone, welcome to this week's Walk in the Light event. My name is Elder Sims. And my name is Elder Kamak, and we will be tonight's hosts. As we get the event started, let us know down below in the comments where you are tuning in from, along with any questions for our Q&A portion of the event. Joining us tonight is New York Times bestselling author, Brandon Mole. Before we introduce him a little more, we would love to open up tonight's event with an opening musical number duet by Elder Acker and Elder Jenkins. Following them, the opening prayer will be offered by Sister Erdley, all of whom are serving as missionaries from the Massachusetts Boston Mission. Sing thy grace, streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me song, melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues of love. Praise the mountain, fix upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Oh, 
here I raise my Ebenezer, here thy great help I have called, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy seal it for thy seal it for thy seal it for thy good Our dear most kind gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this opportunity that you have given us to be able to hear the words of Brennan Mull. We ask you to please help us to be able to hear the things that we need to hear and to be able to learn lots and apply it to our lives. We are so grateful for your loving hands, during this, your hands and everything during this difficult time. We ask you to please bless all those who have been affected by the pandemic. I ask you to please help them find peace and to be able to have strength during this time. We ask you to please help us to find those around us who need our help and to be able to lift those around us. We are so grateful for our, our brother and our loving Savior. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you all so much. That was amazing. As we mentioned, tonight we are joined by Brandon Mull. Brandon Mull is the author of 16 New York Times bestselling novels, including The Fable Haven, Beyonders, Candy Shop War, and Five Kingdoms series. His bestselling series, Fable Haven, is currently published in over 30 foreign languages. In the early 2000s, Brandon spent two years in Chile, where he learned to speak Spanish while serving as a missionary for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Nothing is more precious to him than his family and his relationship with Jesus Christ. Brandon, the time is all yours. Great. Hello. I am coming to you from my home in Utah, but I used to live out in Connecticut. I lived in Connecticut from eighth grade to my junior year in the town of Southbury. Um, and so it's, it's nice to be talking to that part of the country. I get to that part of the country sometimes on book tour um, because I write novels. Sometimes I'll go on the road and speak at schools and bookstores and libraries and Many times I've gone to speak in Massachusetts or Connecticut um, in the years since I published my, my first novel. Um, just a second. All right, so I'm excited for the chance to talk to you today. I'm supposed to say hello to Sister Brock, who is a, whose family is a friend of my wife's. And I'm also supposed to say hello to Elder Benjamin because his uncle is one of my best friends. And so there's a hello to you guys. Um, I'm excited for the chance to talk to you today about my relationship with my Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, it is a, it's a topic I don't get to talk about that much. I, I actually speak quite a bit, but often when I'm speaking, I'm talking about magical worlds and unicorns and satyrs and fairies and dragons fighting giants. Um, recently, I just got back from filming a book trailer where I was at my own funeral and it was all very strange and there's a lot of fantasy in what I do um, but underneath all that fantasy there is there's a, a, a person and a kid who's who's always kind of wanted to know if God is real if you love me 
Um, I, I grew up a member of the, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. My dad um, converted to the church or just kind of discovered the church when he was in high school. And so, so I grew up kind of being taught these things that, that, that I had a, a heavenly father who loved me and knew me, you know, that, that I had a savior, Jesus Christ, who could heal me and help me in my life. And as a, as a teenager, back when I was in Connecticut, I would, I remember walking out in my yard and asking myself these questions of, are you really there, God? And, and then beyond asking myself, I, I remember asking him and, and it was it was at that age that I felt my first kind of stirrings of answers, and it it, it started a a lifelong process and an ongoing process of me trying to learn how to hear communication from God, trying to learn how to hear His voice, try to learn how He speaks to me. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that today, and, and and talk a little bit about how some of the ways He's talked to me in my life, just maybe a, a week ago in family scripture study, I've, I've got a bunch of kids and um, we, we were, we were reading in the book of Mormon and we were reading in the book of Alma in chapter 36. And there was something there that I hadn't noticed before that I found kind of valuable. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll, I'll start off today by, by sharing that with you. So Alma was a prophet here in the Americas. Alma was a very unlikely prophet. This is a guy, we call him Alma the Younger because his dad was also named Alma. Alma was a hellraiser when he was a kid. Um, he, he not only got into trouble, but he was actively fighting against the church of his time. He was actively leading people away from it. Um, and in his own words, after he kind of had a change of heart, he, he, he considered that he was kind of killing people or murdering people spiritually. Um, with his friends who were the sons of um, a king named Mosiah. And Alma, Alma had a really unusual, extraordinary conversion, similar to the conversion um, when Saul became Paul, right? You know, Saul had actively fought against Christ and, 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 and the believers. And then he had this remarkable experience. And after that, he became one of the great advocates of the savior um, kind of in word and deed and everything. And, and Alma had, had a similar kind of change from really cold to really hot. And it partly was because an angel appeared to him and told him that what he was doing was wrong. And he had a disposition, a heart that was such that that actually made a difference. You know, there's people who have seen angels in scripture where it, you know, it might be remarkable in the moment, but it doesn't really change who they are. Alma was not that. Alma, to Alma, it really mattered when he had this experience with the angels. And so I, I'd like to read a little bit. You see, later on in life, Alma had some kids and, and he was teaching one of his sons about this experience he had. And, and so kind of in Alma's words, I want to point out something interesting about this change of nature that he experienced. And so... um. When this, when this angel had appeared to Alma and warned him that what he was doing was wrong, he, Alma was devastated when, when, he, when he learned that, you know, he, some part of him didn't understand that he was doing something that was truly, truly against a God who was real and there and present and loving and real. Um, and when he found out that he was, his guilt was enormous. And, 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 let me just use his words. This is Alma chapter 36, verses 14 and 15. Alma speaking, Yea, and I had murdered many of his children, or rather led them away unto destruction. Yea, and in fine, so great had been my iniquities, that the very thought of coming into the presence of my God did rack my soul with inexpressible horror. Oh, thought I, that I could be banished and become extinct both soul and body, that I might not be brought to stand in the presence of my God and be judged of my deeds. Um, so we see Alma was, <laughs> Alma was panicked as he realized what he'd done and so panicked that he 
he expresses a couple things in those verses that I read. One thing he expresses is that the coming, the idea of coming into the presence of God filled him with like pure horror, right? Another thing he expressed was that he wished he could be extinct, both body and soul. Uh, he felt that bad. He's like, let's, let's just erase me. Like, let's have me like have never existed. Um, nobody wants to feel that way. But, but I thought it actually encapsulated fairly well how we feel when we really know we've done something wrong that we shouldn't have done. I mean, I've had my version of these feelings before um, when, when I've made some of my, my dumbest mistakes. Now, what's beautiful about this is that you watch this change of nature that takes place. Because the, the, the amazing thing about Christ you know, it would be one thing if all he did was wash away your sins so that you're now sinless. But to be real with you, if he just washed away my sins, five minutes later, I'd be, be dirty again. Like five minutes later, I'd do something wrong and then I'd be back at the car wash, back getting my sins washed again. And hey, he's willing to do that. He lets us make, make mistakes over and over. But Christ sometimes does something more than just wipe away your sins, which is if you are willing, if you are wholeheartedly willing to follow him and to commit to his way, he can actually change your nature, not just clean your sins, but change your nature so that your disposition to sin decreases and your affinity for righteousness increases. And sometimes he can do this in ways that we simply can't do for ourselves. Um, it, it's not something that we can earn. It is something we can qualify for. Um, he doesn't do it if we don't want it, because if he did it when we didn't want it, it would change us against our will. And he won't do that. That's not that's not who he is. He wants us to choose who, who we're going to be. But um, so so Alma, in this moment of dread, in this moment of guilt, he makes a choice. And so let me let me keep reading a little bit in verse 17. And it came to pass that as I was thus racked with torment, while I was harrowed up by the memory of my many sins, behold, I remembered also to have heard my father prophesy unto the people concerning the coming of one Jesus Christ, a son of God, to atone for the sins of the world. Now as my mind caught hold upon this thought, I cried within my heart, O Jesus, Thou Son of God, have mercy on me, who am in the gall of bitterness and, in, and am encircled about by the everlasting chains of death. And so we see that, you know, he, this is a guy, he's learned about Christ his whole life. His father was the prophet at the time. But he reached a moment of extreme desperation where he may have said these words before, but this time he said them and meant them, where he asked for Christ to have mercy on him. And to rescue him. He, he really was reaching with all he had for rescue. Um, and, and the result of this is kind of extraordinary. Verse 19. And now behold, when I thought this, I could remember my pains no more. Yea, I was harrowed up by the memory of my sins no more. And oh, what joy and what marvelous light I did behold. Yea, my soul was filled with joy as exceeding as was my pain. Yea, I say unto you, my son, that there could be nothing so exquisite and so bitter as were my pains. Yea, and again, I say unto you, my son, that on the other hand, there can be nothing so exquisite and sweet as was my joy. Now pay, pay close attention to how he feels in this next verse. Yea, methought I saw, even as our father Lehi saw, God sitting upon his throne, surrounded with numberless concourses of angels, in the attitude of singing and praising their God. Yea, and my soul did long to be there. So if you catch this, it was not very long before where he was saying the thought of coming into the presence of God filled him with inexpressible horror and that he would rather be extinct than be there. And in this short stretch, he suddenly is saying, looking into heaven, seeing God and saying, my soul did long to be there. And to me, that is a powerful hint of what Christ can do for us. He can change our nature. He can change who we are. Alma's desires, had he didn't want to be anywhere near God. 
because he felt so terrible about himself. But after being healed by Christ, it was so real and so thorough, he could then turn around look in vision or into heaven or somehow and see God. And he wanted to be there. He didn't want to be extinct anymore. He didn't want to be away from God. He longed to be um, in God's presence. And that is at the core of what Christ can do for us. I've, I've tasted this a little bit. And it's why it's what kind of drew my eye to this because in my some of my most desperate moments, I've reached out in similar ways. And and I remember huh, I remember a specific time when I was 41, 41 and 45 now out on my driveway and just alone and just begging, pleading for God to help me and reaching out my hand and saying, please take my hand. And within a day, it didn't happen in that moment when I was asking, but within a day, he kind of did. He kind of took my hand, like in a way that was understandable to me um, and, and 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 helped me a lot. And so one one of the things that I try to do now is is testify that there is a real savior, that he's not just a figure in a story. He's not just a historical figure who lived 2000 years ago. He really did do what he said he did. He really was resurrected. He really is the son of God. And he really is a being that we can communicate and receive actual real-time help from. Um, and tasting that help makes almost everything else kind of fade to the background a little bit. And, you know, and I, I love my job and, 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 and I don't think my job's important compared to, to this knowledge that there's real help available when we're feeling broken or wounded or when the world's a scary place. Um, that we can be okay on the inside when outside a, a storm is raging. Um, maybe one other verse to set up some stories where I'll share a little bit of things from my own life. Um, in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 3.20, there's a beautiful invitation um, where Christ says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. What, one of the things I focus on in that verse is kind of the, pre the prerequisite. Because the idea of having Christ come in and sup with me, that's a beautiful thought. What do I have to do? If any man hear my voice and open the door. So he's kind of telling me, I I'm there knocking. I need you to learn to hear me. And I need you to learn how to open the door to me. And, and that's a, it's a fair question. And I think it's something that if we take seriously, we can, we can make progress toward it. And you know what? The perfect person to make, help us make progress toward it is him. Um, I have learned in my life that when I, probably my earliest experiences with revelation, or let's say with hearing the voice of God, in a personal way that, that I can kind of understand um, has come with me asking questions about things I should do in my life. Um, and also asking questions like is, you know, are you real? Are you there? Do you love me? Um, is, is this church I believe in true is, is, should I go on a mission? Should I get married? Should I do this for my career? Um, there's many questions I've asked over the years. Um, and I have learned that, when I'm sincere and serious, and especially when I have the intent to act on whatever's given, um, when I'm really open to whatever answer he gives, he will respond in a way that I can understand. And there's sort of a yes feeling that comes sometimes when I ask these questions that is um, felt physically and felt almost in my heart and mind. And it's a little hard to explain, but I know it when I feel it. And I, I challenge you to experiment with some of those questions, um, questioning if God's there, questioning if he loves you, not in a doubtful way, but in a, in a seeking way, because he urges us to seek and to seek diligently, to seek him. Um, every time we ask God a question, we open a door. God honors agency. God honors our ability to choose. And so when we invite him to communicate something to us, guess what? He loves us 
he wants to communicate with us. He wants to tell us things that will help us. He wants to teach us good things, but he doesn't want to force those things on us. So when we ask, we open a door, we use our agency to give him permission to, to give us an answer. And sometimes that answer can come in the moment. And sometimes that answer comes over a period of time. And if that, but I tell you, if the question is sincere and you hold that desire in your heart, the desire of whatever question you're asking until you get an answer, something's going to come. That's my experience. That's what I promise. That's what I believe. And that's what I literally have experienced. So, um, for me, let, let me give you one example. So I, this was when I was a newlywed, I, I, I was a, I was a college student and I wanted to become an author. And that was a scary proposition because I was like, no one is going to marry me if uh, I become, I want to become a fantasy author, you know, as a college student who'd had no success at it. I was like any, any girl I pitch marriage to and they hear I'm a fantasy author will know that our family will starve. And so, um, so I was shy about kind of like revealing that, that pitch like, Hey, want to, want to, want to marry me? We'll starve. Our kids will starve. Everybody will starve. We can beg or something. You know what I mean? Like it just didn't seem cool. But I, uh, I remember I was on a date with the girl that I ended up marrying. And on that date, we talked, she asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I said, Oh, you know, I was majoring in public relations at the time. My secret goal was to become a novelist. My outward public goal was that I would probably get an MBA some, you know, and then see what happened, you know, do something in business. And she asked me, she was like, you don't seem excited about that business idea. And I was like, well, it's, I'm not really excited about it. I was like, what I really want to do is become a writer. And she's like, then you should become a writer. And I was kind of like, then we should probably get married because you don't understand <laughs> how precarious that is. And that's a special thing. Um, I, I ended up, dating and marrying her, not just because she thought I could become a writer, but that really did increase my interest. But I remember as we were newlyweds, um, uh, she gave me a gift that I could write a book. You know, we had just graduated from college. We had just gotten married and she said, write a book. And so I, I, I spent the, Hey, Calvin, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a fireside. Um, I was, she wanted me to write a book. And so I, she worked, we had no kids. I wrote, I wrote a book. It ended up becoming um, a book I later would get published, but at the time could not get published. It was called The Other End of the Hippo about a kid who gets swallowed by a hippo and goes to another world. Um, it's as ridiculous as any of my books. Certainly the premise is ridiculous. Um, but I, I did my best and tried to write a good novel and I tried to shop that novel around. I just had total failure with it. Um, and one thing leads to another, my, my wife was expecting a child and it was time for me to stop writing books full time and get a normal full time job. And I had, I had interviewed in Southern Utah. Um, one of the things my public, public relations major taught me was for me, I just didn't think I wanted to do public relations. And so I thought maybe I'd turn the other way and, and become an English teacher if I couldn't become a writer. And so you, in Utah, you can get an alternate route to licensure by going and teaching someplace off the map a little bit. For me, I had interviewed down at this Navajo reservation in Southern Utah, kind of way far from civilization, this little town called Navajo Mountain. Um, and, but, I, but I got the job as an English teacher and I would finish my teaching certificate online and it seemed like a good opportunity. It seemed like the perfect thing. And so I remember you know, the baby was due in maybe a month and I knelt down and prayed and just to ask God if I could get, if he could tell me, yes, this is okay. This is a good idea to go teach on this Navajo reservation. It did worry me, worry me a little bit because this reservation was pretty far from a hospital. Heck, it was far from a gas station, you know, 45 minutes to a gas station, an hour and a half to a hospital over dirt roads and stuff. And yeah, you know, I was kind of worried. What if something bad happens when the baby's trying to be born? And so I, I, uh, I was, I was, I, I, I just wanted God to endorse the idea. So I remember I knelt and prayed and I just wanted to get that yes feeling. I, I'd had that yes feeling about the Book of Mormon being real and true. I'd 
had that yes feeling about God loving me. I had that yes feeling about going on a mission. Now I was trying to get this yes feeling about going down there. And I just couldn't get it over and over. Um, I, I didn't get a no per se, but I just couldn't get that yes feeling. And I, I told Heavenly Father, I said, I'm not going to go to bed until I have some kind of answer on this. Midnight came and went. Sometime after midnight, I just flipped the question and said, am I not supposed to do this? And I felt that yes feeling. I was like, really? I'm not supposed to do this? Yes. And this was, a, in some ways, a terrible answer to get because I was, at the time, I was, you know, I, I didn't have any other prospects. And I, I had spent a year, a little more than a year, writing that novel. And I felt like everybody, her family, my family, is going to think, oh, this guy, he just doesn't, doesn't want to work. He doesn't want to have a normal job. He just wants to hide in the garage and write fantasy novels or something. I was like, I know this looks like I'm going to be this house husband who, 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 who just has this pipe dream of, of writing fantasy novels. Um, so the first thing I did was wake up my wife and said, Hey, I felt like I got a no on us going to Southern Utah, um, to, to teach on the reservation. Would you please say your own prayer and see if you get a similar answer? And so she got up, she knelt down and she felt a similar answer. And I remember we sat there talking like, well, what do we do now? This is, this was our plan. Like we, we don't have another job for me. As I said, is something just going to come along? And I felt that yes feeling, even though I wasn't praying or anything at the time. Yes. Something will just come along. Um, well, the next day comes. And after the next day came, it was like, was that real last night? Like, am I really going to turn this guy down? I've gone down there. I've interviewed. I, I have the job. I just have to sign this thing and send it in. Um, but this other part of me said, hey, if you're going to ask God, you know, you, you better do what he says. <laughs> like, that's the reason he gave you an answer. Um, and so I, I just tried to follow the answer I got and, and called up the principal of the school, told him I was so sorry that circumstances had changed, that I would not be able to accept the job and was truly worried I would not have a job when my first baby was born. Um, but strangely, after, you know, maybe over the next two weeks, I kept looking for a different job. I did not find one, but one came to me. An old friend called me up, invited me to go do marketing for an independent film company. And when, when I got that offer, I didn't even have to pray about it. I could just feel that this was the thing I'd been waiting for. Um, and I took that job. Now, here's what's kind of interesting about this story. Um, I was disappointed I couldn't get that first book published. I was really disappointed. And I remember one night I prayed about it. And, and after some, some wrestling and prayer, I got a really strong feeling that, that that book would be published. And I remember when I got that feeling the book would be published, I, I was really relieved because I'd learned to trust those feelings. Um, I, mistakenly, I, I, I assumed that that meant it would be published super soon. And that really wasn't what was given, but because I felt like it would be published, I was like, oh, great. You know, my, prob my problems are over. It didn't get published for years, that book, The Other End of the Hippo. But um, here's what happened is when I went to work for that independent film company, I, they got acquired by a publishing company. The publishing company was just starting a line of fantasy books. The people at the film company said, hey, we got a guy who's writing fantasy books. And so my books ended up right in front of the publisher. The publisher liked how I wrote. They didn't want to publish the book I'd written, but they liked how I wrote, asked me to write something else. I wrote Fablehaven, and Fablehaven was published immediately when they saw it. Um, and looking back, I can see that if I'd been on that Navajo reservation, I would have been a million miles, you know, or thousands of miles away from that opportunity. Um, that was the opportunity that gave me my big break that started my career after Fable Haven was published shortly thereafter. I was able to quit my day job. Um, I've been publishing full time ever, ever since um, Fable Haven sold millions of copies. And the book that I got that answer would be published after I finished the Fable Haven series. I went back to the other end of the hippo, rewrote it, and it, it became <clears throat> my Beyonders series. And that was my first book to debut at number one on the New York Times list. And so God remembered that promise he made me. Just took a little while for it to happen. But when it happened, it happened so much better than I could have pictured. He didn't just get it published, but he got it published, you know, at, at the top of the industry in a way that um, I've only had a few books get published at number one. But, but 
Beyonders was one of them, that one that I had that yes answer about years before. So I got to draw to a conclusion here. I'm, I'm about done with my, with my time. But part of what I'm saying is that there is enormous value in learning how your Heavenly Father communicates with you. I promise He is real and actually communicates. And that if you ask, willing to do what He says, and with an open mind for Him to answer how He wants, He will answer you in ways you can understand. And He will lead you to do better things than you can do on your own. It is comes very close to being a cheat code for life to have an all-knowing God give you a little nudge in the right direction. God is the kind of guy who can sink a pull shot with four billion ricochets. Um, you know, if he tells you where to aim, you aim there because all sorts of good things are going to come that you could never have predicted or created for yourself on your own. In addition to that, as we learn to rely on God's guidance in our life, we learn the more important lesson that we can rely on our Savior to actually save us that he can actually take us from the depths of despair and sorrow, um, self-loathing, that he can take wounds that are so deep they would never heal on their own spiritual wounds, and he can actually just straight up heal them. Um, and I know this because he's done it for me in ways I can't deny. And, and that knowledge is the most valuable knowledge I have. It's knowledge I try to share with my kids. It's knowledge I try to share with anybody I care about. Because it's important and valuable to know that there's sort of a secret weapon to help save us from some of the worst aspects of this life and some of the worst aspects of ourselves. Um, I am very grateful to know that I have a Heavenly Father that loves me and to know that I have a Savior who has power to heal me and power to guide me. And I... I I think the greatest adventure for me of this life, though I write about lots of fantasies, the greatest adventure is trying to learn how I can connect with God and be taught by him and led by him. Um, and that is the message that I had to share with you today in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Mole, for your words. We are so happy to have you here on Walk in the Light again. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah, my honor, my, my, my privilege. Yeah, of course. All right, so now we're going to move on to the Q&A portion of this, um, of this event. Um, and we're going to have our first question. All right. It's from James Van Ligvid. I'm not sorry if I butchered your name, but uh, how has the gospel influenced your writing? All right. Maybe Van Langeveld? Van, Van something like that, right? We'll go with that. Van that sounds right. We'll go with that. I was trying, right? Sorry, James, if I messed it up. Um, the Gospels influence my writing a lot. Here's the thing. Um, I don't write about the Gospel directly. Like, at least I haven't much in, in my, my published writings. But indirectly, it influences how I see truth. And a big part of a, of a writer is, is we try to write honestly. Even if we're writing about dragons and giants, we're trying to say true things about courage and bravery and and stupidity and um, and love and you know we're trying to say true things in the context of a make believe story, and so the way the the gospel has colored my life and and helped me see truth influences the kind of stories I tell. I try to tell stories where people get into really tough situations and and work really hard to get out of them. Um, I try to tell stories about light against darkness and and good overcoming evil. And, you know, making it look really dark for good for a while, but but help it, but letting good find a way. And some of those aspects of my writing come, you know, are influenced by the gospel um, and influenced by principles that I think apply to, to good living. That's awesome. I love the fact that you talked about how it's those like eternal truths that you try and put in there, that it's not the gospel directly, but the gospel has influenced your life in such a way that, that it is influencing how you write. And that's really cool. That's been something that a lot of people have been wondering in the comments tonight is how, how that's influenced you as a writer. And it's really cool to see that. Yeah. The, the gospel is inextricable from how I see truth. And so some of the things I, 
I think about good principles or true principles definitely um, are influenced by the gospel. And if, if you read with that lens, you'd see little, little, little pieces of that in some of my stories, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. For sure. Well, we're going to go ahead and well, we're going to pull up our next question right now. So this next one comes from Rebecca Lambert, and she says, how does your understanding of repentance and learning to make decisions affect your characters in your books? Yeah, um, repentance is a big one. You know, I, I've got this character, Seth, in Fablehaven. And Seth is a recklessly curious kid. He's the kind of kid who could make the same mistake in 10 different ways and, and still not learn the lesson kind of. You know what I mean? Because he's... Yeah, yeah. He's not doing it to be mean. He's not doing it to be bad. That's part of the problem is is he's fairly sincere, but he just is so curious. He'll sometimes cause some serious mayhem. And, and there have been situations in Fablehaven where where Seth made some mistakes that that had some pretty grave consequences. And and in fact, it Fablehaven has a sequel series called Dragon Watch. And as you get into Dragon Watch, you, you see some of the heavier consequences of um, Seth dealing with some of the darker creatures, his curiosity with some of the darker creatures paints him into kind of a corner. Um, and very much, I think you'll find that Dragon Watch, the series I'm working on now, is sort of a story of Seth's redemption from, from some of his, his bad mistakes and, and looking for how, how can he redeem himself. Um, because I think any story of redemption, any story of repentance is the story of every human being. You know, I think there's something supremely relatable to a story about redemption and repentance. And, you know, so I, I, I probably don't even use repentance as a word in the whole book. But but what he's doing in, in the over the course of the series is largely him learning and growing to 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 feel sorry for some of his mistakes and to search. Is there a way to overcome this and overcome who I've become because of these mistakes? And and, and you'll have to see if I find a way. But but it definitely influenced the story. Yeah, for sure. I think we can all definitely re relate to that guy. Um, you know, us as humans are always making mistakes no matter what. Um, there's no one perfect. And so I, you know, I think that's that's an awesome example of how we can, you know, become and be able to have redemption in our lives. Mm -hmm. but, we come down here hardwired to make mistakes, right? Fallen <laughs> people, fallen bodies, fallen world. You're, you, you've got mistakes built into you. And, and it's a question of, can you yeah. seek the right sources to help you overcome it? You know? Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. It's all about getting back up. That's right. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So we're going to move on to the next question. Um, it's from Blair Bowen. Um, she's a missionary here and she said, how do you accept his healing in your life? Well, thanks sister Bowen. That's a great question. Um, I think for me to, to really get help from, it's happened at different levels throughout my life, the getting help from Christ. Um, and, and I felt it all along, like, like in small ways and sometimes in big ways. Um, but I think the help I got from the savior got more extreme as I realized I was actually fallen. As I realized that I had some weaknesses that given infinite time, I was not going to overcome. You know, I, I'd lived long enough to try as hard as I could in certain areas and discover, you know, I, in general, I'm an achiever. Like I, I usually fight battles I can win and I'm pretty used to, to winning some of the battles I fight. Um, but I learned that that built into me, there was some things that, man, some weaknesses, some things that even when I tried hard to overcome them and, and tried to be the, the guy I wanted to be, and I, I found that Sometimes there were obstacles I just couldn't overcome on my own. And it, and, and it seemed to almost be simultaneous with me realizing I could never overcome it on my own, that I really was fallen. I think that realization made me reach out to the Savior with greater sincerity, greater realness. And there was something powerful that happened there where he reached back with greater realness when I reached out, you know, with with, with, with a higher level of sincerity. And, and maybe when I reached out kind of with the knowledge that I really needed him, um, he reached back in a way that gave me healing that I did not know was on the menu that went beyond what I thought was possible where he, you know, there are promises in the scriptures that he can turn some of our weaknesses into strengths. And I felt him in a moment 
take a couple of weaknesses that had been weaknesses my whole life and that I was sure would be a weakness of mine forever because I just thought this is who I am. This is how I'm wired. And he um, just took them away, just literally turned them into strengths. Like, like uh, he did it so quickly, like did it in a moment. It took a few days for me to realize like, this isn't coming back. Like he didn't, he just didn't just put me in a good mood. He took something that I thought I could never get rid of and fixed it. And so accepting his healing, like, you know, that was a kind of healing that I, I wouldn't have dared hope. You know, it's something I thought maybe he could do like in the afterlife or something, but to have, to have tasted that a little bit in my life showed me that, Oh, like you can fix anything, you know? And, and, and I know that now and, and he didn't fix everything about me, but he fixed a couple things that were so noticeable that I'm always carrying that around with me as if I was a guy that didn't used to have legs. And now I've got legs. I'm always carrying around with me those things that he fixed about me. And, and it, and it lets me know that he can fix anything. And so I, I'm very grateful um, to him for that. And so I, I would say what helped me accept his healing was understanding I needed it. That's so awesome. Yeah, that's we, I think we can all identify with that fact that we all have those different weaknesses, that we all have those things that we're trying to overcome. And it's just, it's amazing. The fact that we have the power of Jesus Christ, that once we rely on his grace, that once we rely on his power, we can overcome those things. And, and like you said, they can become our strengths. That's one of my favorite scriptures. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. We're going to bring up our next question now. So Bradley McLaughlin says, I have a friend who is hesitant to trust thoughts and emotions as possible answers from God. What insight can you share with them? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great question. I, I remember as a teen, and, and still sometimes as a grown man right now, 45, you know, like wrestling with that. Sometimes you're like, is that just my own thought? Is that just my own feeling? Or did, did God send that? And, um, and, and I'll tell you one thing, it's not always a, a, a simple answer. There really is such a thing as emotions and thoughts that are not given by God. There's a, there's a difference between spirit and emotion. And, and sometimes it takes a little time to, for an individual to recognize that some things that have helped me um if i'm being inspired or feeling to do something that i could generally categorize as good it's like no harm done if i just trust it <laughs> you know what i mean like if there's something in me that goes okay this thought this inspiration feels good it feels like 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 at least even if it was just me i'd still be doing something that was generally good that's comforting because because at least it's good, right? And and maybe it's great. Maybe it's totally God, like 100% God. And you know, but even if it was 100% me, that's still okay. Um, sometimes when I when I feel, should I do this or should I do? You know, when I'm trying to make a choice, sometimes one direction will feel like light. It'll just feel like, oh yeah, I could I could see how that'll work. I could see this being good. And sometimes a choice feels kind of like darkness, like ah, uh, like. The idea of it's okay, but man, this really feels like wrong. Like, like I feel like, like a block here. And like, you know, so sometimes if it feels like light or if it feels like darkness um, can help me uh, like, uh, and sometimes there's a very tangible spirit that comes and that's very confirming. If that tangible spirit comes that really hits hard and says, yes, do this. That's a huge relief when I get that. Cause that's, that, that takes away some of my guesswork. Um, and if you haven't had a feeling like that, that went beyond just like a, maybe yes, you know, like, like that really hit hard and like almost tangibly you felt it. Just keep interacting with God and keep asking him stuff. You'll, you'll sometimes have experiences where you'll literally feel something. So it's kind of like when God's like, okay, I really want you to hear this one, right? He'll, <laughs> he'll hit you with the spirit hard enough that you're like, oh, wow. Like, I wish I got that answer every time. Cause that, was, that <laughs> one was clear, you know, oh, yeah. that's some thoughts on the subject. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We're not, we're not going to receive those sure answers every time. I, I can definitely attest to that. But one of the greatest things that's helped me in that scenario is the fact that there's a quote that says, if it inspires to do good, then it's from the spirit. And just, if it, if it is that light, just following it, following it, no matter what, it's, it's not going to be a bad thing. If it's inspiring you to do good, worst case scenario, it's not from the spirit, but it's still going to lead you in a good path. So. Those are great thoughts. And, 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 and if you're in the habit of getting what you think might be communication from God and then living it out, putting it into action, 
I promise that that will increase the frequency of those impressions. So like if, if, if you develop a habit of following any good impression that strikes you, I promise you, God will take notice of that and, and it'll come more frequently. And as it comes more frequently, you'll get more familiar with how to recognize it. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. I know, you know, for a lot of people, it's kind of hard to feel the spirit and know exactly what, which voice we're listening to. Um, and that leads us right next into our, into our next question. Um, one that says, Brandon, how do you, how do you hear him? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, some things that help me is, uh, when I turn my thoughts to him, when I'm alone, it doesn't necessarily have to be a formal prayer, but when I'm alone and have some time to think, and I'm not kind of drowning it out with other input, right? Like no music on or anything where, where I can really kind of, that could be in the shower, even it could be in the car alone. It can be on purpose out taking a walk alone and just almost having a conversation with God in my mind or just even thinking about my life or thinking about prince, good principles in my mind. Sometimes there's just a voice that gives me stuff I shouldn't know or gives me stuff that's smarter than what I usually generate on my own. And sometimes I can hear him in that a little bit. I can just hear, sometimes the same thing will happen when I'm reading the scriptures. I'll read the scriptures and I'll have an insight or an understanding into what I'm reading that, that goes beyond what I'm used to thinking to myself, <laughs> you know what I mean? Where it yeah. just feels like there's someone smarter whispering in my ear right now. And, 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 and that's a good feeling. Sometimes I feel like I can hear him that way as I'm, as I'm reading the scriptures and he'll, he'll like that little insight I shared about, um, how, how Alma at first didn't want to be anywhere near God. And then after Christ helped him, suddenly he wanted to be in God's presence again. I had never noticed that shift, but, as I was reading that chapter the last time, I almost felt that prompting to pay attention to that little detail. And it, it was meaningful to me. And so that's one of the ways I'll sometimes hear him. Um, and uh, it, for me, it's usually pretty subtle, but it's um, sometimes there'll be a, a, almost like a physical, tangible, spiritual pow that, that will hit with something he communicates to me. And those, those moments are neat too, because it, it's so tangible and I can think back to how tangible it was. You know? Yeah, that's so awesome, um, especially because our prophet has, our prophet has, you know, asked us to figure out how we should hear him personally. Um, you know, that's what he really has, has set as a focus for us as members of the church and also for, you know, really everyone to learn how we can hear the voice of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's so important to be able to know how we can do that. Mm -hmm. We apologize for the, the picture shift we had issue that we're going to pick really quick uh, just one second but cool. in the meantime we're going to go ahead and we're going to bring up our next question so this one comes from nathan fetzer and obviously you you, you served your mission just like we did and you served in chile uh, if i recall and nathan fetzer is wondering can you bear your testimony in spanish yeah i, I can probably do that um yo sé que dios vive yo sé que Jesucristo es mi salvador. Yo sé que um, yo tengo mucho. Estoy agradecido por tener un padre que me ama. En el nombre de Jesucristo. Amen. Amen. Bien hecho. Quick little testimony. Right? Perfecto. Perfecto. Bien hecho. <laughs> awesome. Well, Brandon, we appreciate you so much for coming today. Um, we really, I, me personally, and I feel like everyone has also been spiritually uplifted from, from your messages. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the invitation to talk about spiritual things. It was uplifting for me too. I think, thanks for the chance to do it. Yeah, of course. So with that, we are going to move into our closing. Um, we are going to have a closing musical number performed by Elder Barbie and Elder Rustine. Uh, following them, we will have the closing prayer by Sister Richardson. And we will go to that point. Brightly beams our Father's mercy From His lighthouse evermore But to us He gives the keeping Of the lights along the shore 
Let the lower lights be burning, send a gleam across the way. Some poor fainting, struggling seamen, you may rescue, you may save. Dark the night of sin has settled, loud the angry billows roar. Eager eyes are watching, longing for the lights along the shore. Let the lower lights be burning, send a gleam across the way. Some poor fainting, struggling seamen, you may rescue, you may save. Trim your feeble lamps, my brother, some poor sailor tempest-tossed, trying now to make the harbor in the darkness may be lost. Let the lower lights be burning, send a gleam across the way. Some poor fainting, struggling seamen, you may rescue, you may save. You may rescue, you may save. Nuestro querido Padre Celestial, te damos muchas gracias por este día y por la oportunidad que hemos tenido a escuchar las palabras de Brandon Moore. Te damos muchas gracias por lo que pudimos aprender y por el espíritu que sentimos. Y te pedimos que bendigas a él con tu espíritu para que él pueda seguir en todas sus actividades. Te pedimos que nos bendigas a nosotros y que podamos llevar con nosotros ese mismo espíritu que hemos sentido aquí, que podamos recordar lo que hemos aprendido y poder aplicarlo a nuestras vidas. Y te pedimos que podamos recordar um, todos, todas las cosas que hemos visto en nuestras vidas, cómo nos has ayudado y cómo nos has protegido y que podamos recordar el sacrificio de nuestro Salvador Jesucristo. Te pedimos que podamos ayudar a otras personas a sentir ese mismo espíritu y estas cosas, te las pedimos y te las agradecemos en el nombre de Jesucristo. Amén. Ok, awesome. All right, well, Brandon, is there any last words you'd like to share with us? No, that was great, guys. I love what you guys are doing. Good job, elders and sisters. And awesome. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate, again, your time. And thank you, everyone that has watched. Uh, make sure you share and comment. Um, and make sure to turn in next week, tune in next week for Walk in the Light. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for coming. And thank you for your comments, for your likes. And we love you all. Have a great night. Good night.